Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we are in your presence this morning with grateful hearts for your goodness to us. And we know that you are present with us this morning. And we ask, Lord, that you will speak to each one of us. Lord, I'm aware that without you, I can do nothing, we can do nothing. We depend on you, we count on you. Grant me your grace to speak your word with the power and authority that come from you. Praying, Lord, that your word shared will bear fruit in the lives of your children. We thank you and bless your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Please turn with me to that passage that was read for us, Colossians chapter 3, starting to read from verse 1. The theme for our sharing this morning is laying a firm foundation for transformation. And uh, that's our theme for this semester. And today we are going to see how dealing with the old man, as the chaplain has put it, but also you meant woman, I'm sure. Dealing with the old man in us, the, that old nature in our lives helps us to lay a real firm foundation, helps us to lay a real firm foundation for our lives. Colossians chapter 3 and verses 5 to 11. Let me start by making four introductory remarks briefly. First is to let you know that Paul writes this letter to believers of the church in Colossae, they were not pagans. You may be surprised at the type of things he says they should put to death, but they were believers, men and women who were born again, who had believed in Jesus and accepted him as Savior and Lord. And he writes to them this letter and we know that this city of Colosse is was in Asia Minor, which is present day Turkey. So this is where the church was located, a church that are, came into existence through the vigorous evangelistic ministry of St. Paul and his colleagues, as we read about it in Acts chapter 19, the founding of that church. Secondly, that this congregation soon came, became under attack of false teachers. False teachers who were undermining the supremacy of Jesus Christ and teaching other things. Teaching other things that un were undermining, putting an emphasis on ceremonies, the worship of angels, the observance of days and moons and seasons instead of the focus on Jesus Christ. And the first chapter and the second chapter of Colossians are actually devoted to that Paul addressing that heresy, that false teaching. It is interesting how these things keep carrying on. In Kampala Diocese, we are now battling with false teaching. We are battling with false teaching. Instead of focusing God's children on the cross of Jesus Christ, there is false teaching that is spreading like fire about super grace. You may have heard about it. About the worship of stars and moons and seasons. You may have heard people who emphasize you must wake up and pray every three hours. 
promotion of astrology. There are people who are emphasizing altars and covenants, and it's becoming a problem for us in the diocese and it's spreading to the other diocese. But the Archbishop has set up a committee to address that. Deviating people from the focus of Christ to things that undermine his supremacy and his authority. So in chapter 3, Paul, having dealt with false teaching, he now focuses on Christian conduct, how we should conduct ourselves as men and women who have confessed Jesus as Lord. How should we live? And you know, brothers and sisters, there is such a thing as a Christian way of life. And this is partly what I'm going to be sharing with you. There is a way expected of us as believers, as believers, as men and women who know God. And Paul shows us in this section that we are going to look at how we should conduct ourselves. So he deals with Christian conduct, Christian behavior. In fact, he repeats it in Ephesians chapter 4. If you want to read about how we should behave as Christians, read Colossians chapter 3 and Ephesians chapter 4. I did mention that you will be surprised that he's saying these things about believers. But I would like you to note that before we come to Jesus Christ, before we receive Jesus in our lives, we have the old nature. We have our old humanity, the old man or the old woman who controls us, he directs us. Sometimes this old man is called the flesh. In Galatians, it's also called the world. John calls it the world, the world of evil around us. So before we come to faith in Christ, there is this force in us, each one of us. There is this force in each one of us. Now when we become Christians, we receive the spirit of God. Every believer who confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior has the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. That spirit of Christ that helps in our transformation, our regeneration, that works in our lives to make us look more and more like Jesus Christ. The one who makes us new, a new creation, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. He says, anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. Here is then the challenge that you have received Jesus Christ, you have the spirit of God, but I want to assure you, and, and I know some believers want to believe that the old nature goes completely, it doesn't. So there is still aspects of that old nature in you which the spirit is dealing with to transform, to change, to regenerate. I normally use the word panel beating. I think it helps me understand the work of the Holy Spirit better. You know, when a car gets into an accident, they take it to the garage. And those people in the garage have a process they call panel beating and straighten the parts that have been crushed. So the Holy Spirit then continues with that work in us, straightening those areas in our lives that need panel beating. So you are born again, yes, you have the spirit of God, you may even be tongue speaking, yes, but then there is this conflict in you. You have two forces. You have the two forces. And your character will be determined by the forces 
that appear stronger in your life, even when you are a believer. So for these brothers and sisters, they had received Jesus as Lord and Savior. You hear how they are described in verses 1 to 4. They were not pagans. Paul writes and says, so if you have been raised with Christ, they had been raised with Christ, and you are seated and you are seeking things that are above. They were really not pagans. They had been raised with Christ, seeking things that are above. They had set their minds on things that were above and not on things that were on earth. And in verse 3 it says, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ Jesus in God. And he says in verse 4, that when Christ appears, they will appear with him. So they were, they were really Christians, men and women who were born again, if we are to use our familiar language. But then they had these problems coming from their flesh, from their old nature. Remember I said the spirit then begins to fight so it's like you have, you have a civil war, a spiritual civil war. There are this dark side of your past, and there is the new Jesus and his spirit who has come into your life. And if you read Romans chapter 7, you'll find Paul himself, this great man of faith, struggling. In Romans chapter 7, he says, when I want to do right, when I want to speak the right words, I want to do the right things, I find myself doing the wrong thing. And you may have all the good intentions, and you say, this semester, I'm not going to copy the exam, but you find yourself copying. And Paul says, I don't understand, in verse 14, Romans 7, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. This is Paul. He's having this conflict. So what was happening with these brothers and sisters was that the sinful nature, though they were born again, was still being manifested in them. Was still being manifested in them. And so in verse 5, Paul says they need to put to death that sinful nature. He says in verse 5 of our text, he says, put to death therefore that which is earthly in you. I said these, these were believers. And I would want to keep reminding you that they were believers. They were not pagans. They were born again, just like our brothers and sisters who have recently given their lives to Jesus Christ in our last mission. And those of us who are here who are born again. But these believers still had elements that belonged to their earthly nature, the old man and old woman, the flesh, Activities that we do because of the influence, influence of the sinful nature. And Paul writes to them, to this church, because they have been observed among them as believers and says, put to death. And he, he is not giving them advice. He is not asking for their consent. He is not giving them an option. Put to death in the Greek is a command, he's commanding them. He's not asking for their opinion. It is an imperative, it is a command. They are commanded to put to death, to put to death these vices. They only have three alternatives. One is to put to death, 
the second is to put to death, the third is to put to death. Those are the alternatives, the choices they have. Because it is affecting their Christian witness. So it says, put to death. Get rid of this completely from your lives. Paul is in Romans 6, 11, uses another language about sin and says, you should consider yourself as one who is dead to sin. Put to death, therefore. Put to death, since you are believers. And that's why he says, therefore. Why therefore? Because in verses 1 to 3, these men and women of God know Jesus. They have received Jesus in their lives. They have received Jesus in their lives. But there were these vices, these sins in their lives, a catalog of them belonging to the nature, the old nature, the old man. And unless you deal with that, your Christian foundation will be shaken. And that's why we are looking at them in light of our theme for this semester, that if we are to have a firm foundation as believers, we must deal with the old nature in our lives. This, this catalog of things, you wouldn't expect this among Christians, for sure, who are tongue-speaking. The first one, he says, put to death fornication. Would you expect born again people to fornicate? No. But these brothers and sisters were. He says, put to death. And this seems to top the list. Fornication is sexual immorality, engaging in any kind of unlawful sexual intercourse. This is illicit sex. Illicit sex, sexual activity outside marriage, apart from marriage. And I'm saying these were believers engaging in illicit sex. Sex anywhere and anytime and for anything. These days, people can give themselves up for data, for airtime, for a phone, maybe Rolex. <laughs> because they do it, else sex is something you do for anything, anytime. And it says you must completely get rid of this. Completely get rid of this. The next that follows, fornication, is impurity, which is in a way related to sexual immorality. Impurity, especially in relation to sexual sin, uncleanliness, filthiness, which is in a way related to sexual sin. The third one, he says, is passion. That driving force that drives you to do something and until you have done it, you don't rest until you have done it. And he follows it up with lust, which is also sinful sexual desires, sinful sexual passion, evil longing, Last, which is the biggest problem of men, last, when you endlessly look at that woman who is not your wife, look at that girl, last, last. Sometimes these brothers, when they say they love you, they're actually lasting. You had better be open to them and say, you, you say you are lasting. Last. And he talks of evil desires. All these are related to sex. 
about the first four things and points to how serious this issue was among them. And so he says, you must get rid of this completely from your lives. This uncleanliness. But of course, if someone was not a member of UCU community, he would be surprised. You know, we can't talk about this. This is Uganda Christian University. They are clergymen training here, holy people of God. I hope they look at you in a spiritual way because that's what we keep training them. Be holy because the one who has called you is holy. But if they begin to be close, you should let us know. Close in a very unhealthy way. I remember when we were at university, I think it was around 1983, we had a mama, a very strong mama, your elder sister, Eunice. She was our mama, the elder sister of Mrs. Deborah Mugawe. Mugawe. And so she's speaking to us in the Christian Union in St. Francis Chapel on sexual, pu sexual purity. And this is what she told our sisters. I want to repeat it. I still remember it after these years because I think it was important. He said, you sisters, you have the key. You have the key. Unless you open and offer yourself, there is no man who can come in. Unless you offer yourself. So she was saying, you have the key. But then there was this unfortunate addition that some sisters, I think, had opened up and lost their padlocks and their keys. So they are, they are always open for whoever. But you really hold the key, you ladies. You hold the key. Go and get another padlock if you have lost it with the new keys and keep them safely. That's what gives you value. Your sexuality gives value to you. That's what devalues you if you consider yourself as a cheap girl. You are so precious in the eyes of God. It says, get rid of these sex-related sins. As Christians, you have been born again, and as we heard in our song, we should not go back to that nature. Never, never. The other one who among them was greed. Greed. Strong desire to possess more things than other people have. Even those that you don't need, you still want to have them. That's greed, the kind of greed, says a this kind of greed of wanting to have more and more. You know, when I hear someone has stolen 10 billion, I ask myself, what does he need all that for? I really don't understand. 20 billion. And at the end of it, all you need is a two by six. People who are grabbing land, acres and acres of land, you don't need all that land. You need two by six. So he says it is a form of idolatry. It is a form of worship of idols. That kind of greed is like worshiping idols. And he says this should not be among you. Get rid of it completely. Put to death. And he says in verse six and seven, in verse 6, he says, because of this, God is going to judge you. This judgment, on account of this, the wrath of God is coming on those who disobey. And he says, rightly so, that we used to walk in this. Before I received Jesus Christ, I was in high school, in entire school, in senior five, in 79. He says, before, during 
that life when the forces of evil, the old nature, we used to engage in those things. But he says, now you have a new status. You have Christ in your life. And you must put to death the evil that is in you. Get rid of them. Repeats it in verse 8. But now you must get rid of such things like this and increases the catalog. Anger. Anger. In verse 8. We really want to thank you and commend you. And the person who was praying did mention it, thanking God that you were calm because the elections didn't happen. If it was in another university, they would have rioted. But thank you for being calm. And those who are standing, the presidential candidates, for reigning over their, lead, their supporters, we really want to thank you for being calm. Because anger does not belong to those who know Christ. It doesn't belong to Uganda Christian University. It belongs elsewhere. And it says we must get rid of anger. We must get rid of rage. Outbursts of anger. Get rid of malice. To have hateful feelings about others. It says get rid of this. Slander. Speaking evil against other people with a name to undermine their reputation. I have not listened to your campaigns, but I hope that you are being honest and not slandering your friends, those who are standing with you. That you are not saying things that are maliciously undermining their reputation even when you know they are not right. Because this is Uganda Christian University where we should not be slandering one another. Feel the language. I'm sure there has not been any during this campaign speaking obscenely against others. But not even necessarily against others. There are people when they begin to talk, you want to move away. Because all what comes out of their mouth is obscene. He says, if we are believers, we must stop lying. In verse 9, do not lie to one another. Do not lie to one another. You know, these days, people lie a lot on the phone. They lie a lot on the phone. And they don't even mind. There was this driver who was driving us from Masaka, one of our university drivers, and someone called him. So when he was called, he said, oh, I'm just near Boyogerere, Dikumbi. Then I talked to the man, we are in Masaka. <laughs> he, he wasn't even caring that there was a clergyman there. People don't seem, they think they can lie about anything. People lie about their ages. Lying. But it's such a serious thing. Paul mentions it in Ephesians chapter 6 as an important component of our armor. Chapter 6 of Ephesians verse 14, he said, Stand firm, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Fasten the belt of truth. It's a component, a key component of our armor. And you know, Paul was in prison in Rome when he's writing this letter to the Ephesian church. And he said he was watching this Roman soldier who was guarding him. And you know, even when you go to prison, these, they, one, they consider a belt as a weapon. They don't allow prisoners to go to prison with a belt. Even if your trouser is, is falling, they will not allow you. But you know, with the Roman soldier, and you can watch our army next time you see them, but the Roman soldier that Paul was watching, his shirt, the top, was tied to the belt, was being held by the belt, including the trouser, the armor, the sword was tied on the belt, his supplies like water were tied on the 
belt. So it was the belt that was holding all the items that were on the soldier. So once the belt drops, then everything does what? Falls apart. A person who lies can do any other sin. A person who lies is a terrible person. Because a person who lies will steal, a person who lies will murder. So he says, do not lie. And I'm very sensitive to lying. Actually, maybe I should say I'm very allergic, not just sensitive. So he says we should put off all these. Why? Because we have been renewed in Jesus Christ. And we are being transformed by the Holy Spirit of God into our new being. We must put to death all this. And he says, in the body of Christ, this new creation, in verse 11, he says, there is no distinction. We look at each other as brothers and sisters. There is no woman, there is no Jew, there is, you don't begin to have tribal sentiments when you are in Jesus Christ. And you don't promote them. And I'm hoping that during your elections, you are really focusing not on tribes, but on men and women who can help the leadership of this university do the work that has been assigned to them by our university council. That you are looking at men and women of integrity. I want to conclude with the good news that if this sounds heavy, how do you deal with this, with your old nature? The good news is that we have the Holy Spirit to help us. It helps me as well. We have the Holy Spirit that helps us to put to death the old nature. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 3. Verse 13, rather. Romans 8, verse 13. And I found it to be good news in dealing with these evil, evils in our, that are brought to us by our sinful nature. He says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. And of course, that's what we have read about, that there is judgment, God's judgment. But then he says, but if you live by the Spirit, by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, it is the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that helps us put to death these terrible things that keep cropping up in our lives. I like to speak of the Holy Spirit as a prompter. I used to do a lot of drama in secondary school, and I would cram scripts and scripts. I remember representing my school at regional level. But you know, behind there, behind the, the curtains, there is someone called a prompter. That prompter, when you forget a paragraph that you are supposed to recite, he whispers about a sentence or two words, and then you remember. And I, 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 I compare the work of the Holy Spirit to, the, to a prompter. You know, when I'm about to speak a bad word, the Holy Spirit says, no, that is not right. When you are making your accountabilities, and we are sending them back to our finance department, Mr. Mugawe, and you, are, you, are, you, you don't have receipts, the Holy Spirit will say, ah, but that one doesn't have a receipt. Why are you putting it there? And you know you never spent that amount of money. The Holy Spirit is there to help us deal with falsehoods. The Holy Spirit will tell you, but you are taking too long looking at that lady. You had better stop. 
And some of us have cultures where you, are, you hug each other. And Bishop Muhima was saying, some people stay there much longer. <laughs> the Holy Spirit will tell you that is too long. <laughs> the Holy Spirit does that, my brothers and sisters. It will tell me, but you haven't covered the syllabus. As a lecturer, are you honest? Are the marks you are awarding the students matching the work they have produced? Or you, are, you want to get them off your head and they call you a good lecturer because you are awarding them marks that don't even compare with the output? You know, the other time we wanted to the library to upload our dissertations, put them online, and the librarian said, these dissertations are poor quality. They will taint the name of the university. But how can a dissertation that has A to be poor? That means there is a problem with us as lecturers as well. Are we being honest in grading our students? And the librarian said, I'm not going to do that. How can a dissertation with A to be poor? How being sincere, the Holy Spirit will tell you you are awarding marks for something that is poor, that is poor, if you are a Christian. So we have help of the Holy Spirit. It helps me, it still helps me, it, can, it will continue its work. So that we deal with this nature. And if you open yourself to the Holy Spirit, this work of sanctification, of transformation, is a process. It doesn't happen. God is not done with me yet. Even with me, God is not yet done. There are things that the Holy Spirit continues to perfect in my life. And the goal is one, so that I may look more and more like Jesus Christ in my conduct among students, in my conduct at my home, so that even when I'm preaching like this, my wife can say, yes, my husband doesn't touch, touch, touch other people's. <laughs> that he, my husband can be trusted with mother's union. There are some pastors who can't be trusted. <laughs> when people hear that their wives are going with that pastor, they begin to pray that you can be trusted. I was reminded of a pastor who was preaching about love. It was Canon Kasamba who told us that story. And his wife was in the congregation. She stood up and said, you can deceive others, but not me. And she walked out of church. Because that life of that pastor was not matching what he was saying. But I'm assuring you that the Holy Spirit continues to work on my life transform me, to continue the work of sanctification, the work of transformation. And it is my prayer for you, my brothers and sisters, that we shall allow the Holy Spirit, who indwells each believer, that we shall be attentive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, that we shall allow him to panel beat us, and some of the panel beating can be painful but that we shall allow that work to continue so that we can begin to appear as Christ is and that our institution of Uganda Christian University, that when people come here, they will not only see the good compound, but when they interact with us, they will say, this is truly a Christian institution. I pray that God will do that and continue to do that in our lives. Let us allow and open our lives to that work of the Holy Spirit to deal and with the sinful nature, to get rid of it completely. And I'm saying it is possible by the help of the Holy Spirit to live a pure life, a holy life, a life that honors God, a life, that kind of life is a firm foundation even for your work, for your profession, all what you do for your marriage, once you deal with this, it gives you a firm foundation to live a life 
that brings glory to God. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.